feel like I'm being auditioned or something. <laughs> you oh, are. Um, okay. I'm casting later. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, there may or may not be a time jump for season two. Are you allowed to reveal how quickly the story picks back up? Uh, no, not really. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. We, I've been really. saying it all day. I know, but I was trying to stop you. <laughs> no, no, but I said it in front of the producers. No. Um, Tell me. It, it kind of does pick up from where we are, but there is a kind of a uh, few things different. You know? Well, I mean, things are starting to play out on different realities. I can say that. Yeah. Um, so, but, so we get to explore that a little bit, but, I mean, we're 21 days into the story and we're in episode 7 of season 2, so it's moved pretty, it's moved slowly. Yeah. And also, I was told by the writers, you know, they're not actually doing every one episode, it's not one day, you know, it's not no. now. No, it's episode changing. 5 was two days. Right. No, but it's not, they don't, it's like, not as, I don't know, Eric said to me that it wasn't as kind of, uh, suck anymore. All right. I don't know. Anyway. Well, that actually gives me a really great segue. Can you tell us about the bromance between uh, your characters? Like, Frank and Ed, they seem to have, like, a lot of... Well, in season one, but season two, it kind of goes, you know... It starts to fall apart. It kind, you know, yeah. It, it starts to kind of... Uh, cracks start to appear. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. That's, that's sort of, of the theme for the whole second season of the show, is that you start to see the cracks. Cracks. Of, of, of being... Of, in all facets of life, after being... Living under uh, an oppressive regime, and you and you kind of you, and people start taking you know both Ed and I you know we take you know very sort of individual journeys and conflict starts to appear. So it's really it's been really interesting. Uh, it's been a really good season so far. But we do get into a little bit of the backstory about understanding why they are why Ed is so de- devoted to him. Yeah. So we get a little backstory to understand that. At the same time, when it starts to fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> Towards Are you kidding me? She's a bitch. <laughs> According to Frank Frank. No, <laughs> never me. I blame um, <laughs> No, Ed, Ed so, blames him. No, 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 totally. I mean, I'm Frank Frank, my character, uh, yeah, he is very, very, very upset. And feels betrayed, you know? Um, I think he, he feels like he's, you know, in season one, we see him kind of doing everything his whole life is revolved around her he has given up a lot in his you know from his point of view and so season two he kind of takes control um, and steps forward and decides to try and find a path in his life for himself and to kind of work out the events of what happened in season one and deal with that you know the loss of his family and uh, how he approaches that so that's kind of the theme of season two for Frank Frank it sounds like it spun them all out in different directions I would have thought that would have been a bonding Sorry, say that again? It sounds like it spun them out in different directions, but it seemed like it should have brought them closer together. Well, life works in very various weird ways, hey? So we'll see. I think that the, well, the, the journey kind of, you know, is fluid. Well, the reason why it spin, spins them in different directions is because everybody's coming, approaches their life from a different, like, Ed loves safety. And this, this now safety net's gone. Like, like his life sucked, but he's had a life that he was safe in. And then it changed. And when things start to change around you, you start to look for people to blame. And, uh, and in his mind, there is, a, there is, some, there is blame. There, there is somebody that who's not following the plan and putting himself at risk and then putting the character at risk. So, I mean, there's no way that... I think it's also survival of the fittest. You know, if you live in a world where... I mean, we've never experienced it here in the States, have we? We've never been occupied. Do you know, actually here in mainland America, you know what I mean? And, I mean, I'm, I'm English. And so, I, ha- I mean, Britain hasn't been occupied, but France obviously was. And I think the Europeans have had a taste of it. But I promise you that I think from what I... When, when I was at school, you know, that the idea of being occupied at some point there is an argument for survival of the fittest and actually looking after you and being able to cope and live in this world you know for yourself and you know to eat to breathe to, you know all those kind of very you know elemental you know very basic level things and I think that turns people into very you know turns you turn into very different people so you're traveling with five of your best friends and you all want to go to lunch you have one common goal we're all going to eat somebody wants pasta we had pasta two fucking weeks ago like that kind of thing so everybody wants it but they have a different idea how to achieve it yeah. that will fissure a group that will crack a group and these are a bunch I mean, and this, and apply that now to what's happening when, you, when you're under occupation and we know we need to leave we know something has to change I have my idea how it would change you have yours it will alter the nature of the relationships we love each other we do I mean you know yeah 
characters bind to the idea that there might be an alternate reality, another you know version of what could have happened before this time. Everybody in their lives. <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't think I can answer that really. Um, it's funny because tomorrow I'm doing a scene like about that. <laughs> Uh, how much do we put? Well, for Frank Frank, you know, everything goes back to Juliana for him, and everything that's happened with Juliana, he kind of blames the end of season one really on the films, the film reels. If it wasn't for her coming back with that reel at the very beginning, none of this would have damn happened, you know what I mean? So for him, he, you know, he really. He blames these reels, he blames what they show, you know, throughout season one, and season two he starts to realize, you know, that he, he, he kind of, he still hates them and he's very angry about what they represent to him, but they seem to somehow always find their way back into his life. Mm. So he has to confront that and deal with that and, and, and sort of confront them, really. So the, 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 it's weird, the reels kind of are like a kind of motif for the whole thing, really. It's kind of, they're always there, but, you know, unobtainable, and so he... For, for me, he kind of goes, um, for, for Frank Frink, these reels are, and the alternative reality is both a, a blessing and a curse in some kind of way. It's a kind of like a nightmare that he can't get out of. He'd rather be in this ignorance. In a kind of way, he's jealous of Ed, in a kind of way, because he sees Ed, and, and, he, and I, Ed may not see this, but Frank's sort of perception is that Ed lives this very sort of, you know, simplistic life. He has his conspiracy theories, these ridiculous conspiracy theories as Frank Frank sees them. But actually, you know, it's not, it, you know, it's easy for, you know, for Ed in a kind of weird way. But that's a very kind of arrogant way of looking at it. But I think Frank Frank is in that kind of place. So, yeah. Yeah, Ed doesn't know about the films yet. So, I mean, Ed's been in the clink, so he doesn't know any of this stuff yet. Mm. It'll be interesting to see what happens when he finds out about them. In season one, uh, Frank is carrying a lot of emotional weight, and then with the loss of his sister and um, yeah. just children, and of course being so in love with, being so caught up in or with uh, Juliana, does he, how much of that struggle, or and then the effect of the films, as you said, how much of that struggle are we going to see continuing to play out in season two? It continues, but in a very different way. And I think actually he, instead of in season two, I think, um, you know, at the end of season one, we see, you know, that the, the, it's sort of left, isn't it, in a, in a moment where we're not quite sure what will happen. We see Juliana at the edge of the dock, waving goodbye to Joe, Joe Blake. And there's a, there's a fallout from that and the choices that she makes. And the fallout is huge. And I think then we see Frank Frank kind of uh, really trying to discover himself for himself and work out who he wants to be and what kind of person and how he wants to live in this world now. And I think for him, Frank Frank, this is all great character stuff, and I'm sorry if it's boring, but anyway. Um, for Frank Frank, you know, he has his whole life with Juliana. He did everything for her. And after that all, you know, she betrays him in his eyes. So he is suddenly this anger. Uh, and actually, there's a great scene with me and DJ. When, um, I receive a... Uh, oh, I receive a letter. And, um, and uh, that's, you know, that, that really shifts everything for him. And the whole season really kicks off for Frank Frank from that moment. Kind of, I don't know, genteel, didn't want to get involved. Yeah. And suddenly he turned into kind of badass kind of, you know, strategist. <laughs> well. Where did that come from? <laughs> well, you know, I think events, you know. I think if your family die and your sister gets killed and your, and your nephew and niece and you can barely walk down the street without someone, you know, potentially taking you in just... For, and the fact that he's Jewish or part Jewish, although he doesn't see himself as Jewish, he, this, these people have labeled him as that. You know, I think he, at some point, he looks around and he, and, you know, looks at himself and says, well, I've been living this way, this type of life, I've been, and that hasn't worked. And I think, you know, I think hatred and anger and pain and emotion does crazy things to people. And I think he, you know, he, he uh, decides through that pain to take matters into his own hands to, to, to make a difference perhaps and you know in season one we see him you know trying potentially shoot the the, the, the Japanese emperor and stuff 
you know, I think it's a grieving process of anger and hatred and confusion and how you deal with that. You know, it's a, it's a, emotions are crazy things. They make people do some nuts stuff, you know, crazy stuff. DJ, in season one, or should say in general, how, how do you, how much, if at all, do you identify with your character Ed? And uh, what are you looking forward to seeing him develop as uh, as he finds out about the films, perhaps, and that that kind of curtain coming down or opening and him seeing other things? You don't know about the films at all. No, I don't. Must chew in and not mention it. We've never talked about it. So Yo, Jules left. I got you locked me in a closet when you went to shoot. The, <laughs> this is a really good story. When you, when That's you a went, really good story. When you locked me into, I know I'm. I'm gonna pitch it. You must talk to everyone. Um, I know. Uh, imagine what the imagine what seeing those films would do to Ed's mind. Well, that's what I mean. Fucking mind. That's what we conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, um, guys. Oh, wait, we're talking okay, about. Oh, yeah, yeah. What do I identify with? Um, well, he, it's that's that's it's always a tough question to to ask but to answer because I mean he looks like me. Sure. We have some of the same sensibilities. Uh, that sense of loyalty is, is a big thing with me and and love. Yeah, that's like true. I like I. When I became an actor, I wanted to be an actor from the time I was six years old, and I wanted it so much. I wanted it to the exclusion of everything else in my life, which means friendships and romantic relationships and any of that other stuff. Like I've never met, I've always said I've never met somebody that I would say no to a job for. And so that's sort of so I'm sort of married to this. I'm loyal to this, and but with that. I, fall, I, I sort of have those kind of love feelings that you would have for like a partner to, to, with my friends. Like I love my friends, and I, like if I find out somebody like is having fi hard financial trouble, it, it hurts me. So I that the, Ed has that. I can't live happily if you can't live happily. So what what you do affects me. It's also a kind of torturous martyr way to live that's not healthy. Because if you're making bad choices for yourself, and if I can't help you make better choices and I'm going to be miserable too and so that's what we're that's what's happening to Ed right now it's like well I'm miserable because you're doing things but I'm not going to be I don't want to be miserable anymore so what he's at a point of just asking now what do I do where am I going to go next and I don't know where he's going next I hope it's a, to an awesome place. We'll leave you there, ladies. Yeah, <laughs> hoping it's an hey, awesome John, place. I mean, oh gosh, what he wishes for. I know. I have. I wonder. I wonder if he's gonna wind up in New York. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye, guys.